As your Bibles are open to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, I'm going to read Scripture from last week, and verses 9 and 10, I'm going to add to that. As you come to him, a living stone, verse 4, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. May God add his blessings to the receiving of this word. You may be seated. We just believe God's going to help us in this word today. I started off a few weeks ago uh, talking about spiritual growth, and as we talked about spiritual growth, uh, I wanted to encourage you as a church to understand that we want you to know that it is not an option. Spiritual growth is not optional when it comes to God. God is not looking for us to stay stagnant where we are. The old, the old timers used to tell me that if you stay where you are, you're going backwards. See, the world we live in, let me just kind of put it this way, and I didn't say it in the first service, the world we live in is like being in a rip current or a boat adrift during a current you can't stay where you are you have to fight it or it will take you where it wants to take you that's the world we live in right now and so uh, as you grow spiritually and as you grow in God it is important to know you're not growing you're just like not flippantly you grow for no reason because God desires you to grow to know him better and Peter will say later that we have a purpose in why we're growing but the Bible even is pretty clear that we're to stand up against a wicked and evil generation. That we are to be people of God in the middle of what the world is doing. And so last week I talked about the foundation, the cornerstone Jesus, how you build your life on Jesus. How you build your life on the stone that the builders rejected and the world stumbles over. But to us, he is precious. To God, he is precious. And today I want to talk about how we build our lives, not individually, but as a body, as a church, on the cornerstone that's what he's saying here he's saying that we build not because it's our lives is both and it's our lives and our church who we are as people and who we are as a church are built on the cornerstone jesus christ and so you're going to hear something in this service that i can tell you that you may never heard before and i went pretty pretty complicated in the first service i may i may not try to go that deep in the second service we'll see but I want you to understand that God has called you out to be something greater than just somebody who goes to church on Sunday morning and, and have a place to go before you go to lunch. It's not like you, oh, it's date day. We, we go to church and go eat together, go out to eat. It's more than just that. Okay, yeah, nobody got that, but you'll get it online. The Bible says that we are to grow spiritually, and I've got four points of this message, and we'll celebrate communion. Number one is this. We grow spiritually because you and I realize you are part of a place. You're part of a place. See, the Bible says you yourselves, verse 5, like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. See, the cornerstone is Jesus. He is the foundation of everything we do as a church. And when I talk about this, I'm talking about us as a community, us as a body, not you individually. Just go with me here. Us together, what are we to be about? Matter of fact, we'll celebrate communion together later. Communion is the same word as community. We're part of the body, right? We're part of the church. And so we're building on the foundation, the cornerstone Jesus, the living stone Jesus. And the Bible says we're built up as spiritual houses, as living stones ourselves. In other words, we have Christ likeness that we have Christ like that should be demonstrated through our lives. That, that we are created by the Lord to demonstrate, live out, live as, and to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ and to live like Jesus desires for us to live. That we are little living stones, examples of who Christ is. And the idea is, we, as living stones, that we are fit perfectly to build what we call, and what he says, is a spiritual house. We build a spiritual house by coming together as living stones. See, see, there's something about us coming together as a church that's different than you just showing up. By the way, we're living stones based on the cornerstone Jesus. Our church is not 
found, the foundation of our church is not sports activities. The foundation of our church is not people's opinion. The foundation of our church is not the Republican Party. The foundation of our church is not the Democratic Party. The foundation of our church isn't America. The foundation of our church is Jesus Christ, the living stone, and we build our church out of that. Okay, I got some people nervous already, I can tell. But we're living stones, which means we are perfect, perfectly made by God in our imperfections to fit together to build what's called a spiritual house. Not physical house, a spiritual house, which is a community of God, the people of God, right? 1 Corinthians 12 says that we're the body of Christ. So, so the Bible says that some are hands, some are eyes, some are ears. We're part of the body of Christ. You know why we're part of the body of Christ? He, he, let me just kind of say it very clearly. Because we don't have it all together on our own, and we have blind spots in our lives. So we need the body of Christ to help us grow. Man, I thank, thank the Lord that you see, well, you see it a lot now, but not as much as you used to. This independent spirit that people say, well, I'll just go to, I'll go to church at home. Me and my four will have church at our house because we don't need to go to church. The Lord is present where I am. Well, he is present where you are, but the Bible still commands us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. That some is is you, by the way, if you do that online. <laughs> but the idea is that we come together as a body because we need to help each other as the body of Christ, right? Now, as a spiritual house, it goes beyond just needing each other. It's that we have a place in the body for a purpose. That God has placed you in the church, in this house, to build a spiritual house. Now, what made the temple, the temple was not the beautiful stones. Because Jesus said, each stone will be un overturned when judgment comes. And, and it did. In Romans uh, uh, AD 70, the Romans came in, destroyed the temple. And Jesus said, one stone won't be left on the other because Josephus says the rumor was there was gold between the stones. So the Romans came in and took every stone apart looking for gold. Jesus' words were fulfilled. No stone was left unturned. But what makes the temple the temple wasn't the, the facility. What makes the temple the temple wasn't even the people. What makes the temple the temple was the presence of God. Now let, let me say it a way that sounds maybe a little different for you. That as we come together as a spiritual house, our desire is that we are part of this church and part of this community so that when we are together, we can host the presence of God. That there's a difference that when you're praying by yourself or you're worshiping by yourself, that when you get together in the community of believers, there's a different atmosphere. And in the presence of God, together, God can bring healing and breakthrough and deliverance and strong, you make you strong. And I said it last week, and it was harsh, and it may sound harsh to some of you, but I said, you don't get to sit out a song that you don't like in this church. I mean, you, you may not be your favorite song, but just don't sit it out with an attitude. Because in this church, there, there's this worship experience time is there here for a purpose, and, and the reason we do it is because we want the God's presence to be in the midst of us and to worship, because there's an atmosphere we need to have, because there are people that come to this house and there are people, even last week, who came to this house who were going through some tragedy in their lives that you would not even understand if you had not gone through it yourself. They came to the altar, got prayed for, ministered to. There are people that are hurting in this room and, and bound in this room and need an oasis. I tell our staff all the time, I tell, you, I tell them this. I, I say this, I said it to Kurt right before service. I said, in the church leadership, on the stage or in ministry, no matter what you do, even if you're involved in ministry, realize that your routine, your routine is somebody else's oasis. What does that mean? That means that you may be going through the motions. You don't have, you don't have the right opportunity or the privilege to go through the motions because there are people that are dying, hurting, thirsty, and broken who need you to be on your A game when you come to the house of God. I'm just saying I'm preaching to leaders and for a moment. You, 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 have to, you need to be in your A game because there are people that are broken. I mean, we, we, we had people come in uh, so bad, so difficult pr tragedies that could happen in your life, losing loved ones, losing children, hurting, broken, uh, overwhelmed. And you know what people need? They need God.
to touch them and minister to them. They need something greater than what a, a doctor can tell them, a greater than a pill that they could take. They need the presence of the Lord. And you know how we do that? We do it by being the house that God calls us to be, spiritual house, not a building built with metal, but a spiritual house. And we come together, and His presence shows up. That's why He says this. Here's what He's saying. Friends, when it comes to God, you don't come to a temple. You are the temple. See, the, the Bible's clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you understand the Holy Spirit does live in you, and the Holy Spirit is a part of you. But he says something else in 1 Corinthians 3 that is even greater, in my opinion, than that, or equal to that. He is, he's saying you all, if he spoke southern, his how he would say it. You all are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not, in, not just individually. Individually, the Holy Spirit lives in you, you're his temple. But the Bible says that there's disunity in the church, 1 Corinthians 3, and he says don't let disunity come because don't you know that you all are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that when you're together, that you do something together, you host the presence of the Lord, and he moves in the midst of his people. And so you don't come to a temple, you are a temple. So number one, you're a part of a place. Number two, really, you're, you're a priest. That's where I lost him in the first service. You're a priest. A priest is not someone who wears a, a black robe and puts on a backwards collar. That's not the kind of priest I'm talking about. The kind of priest I'm talking about is someone who, who is in the Old Testament. The Bible even says holy priesthood, or, and it also says royal priesthood. Someone in the Old Testament who... who led the worship of God and, show, and spoke to people for, spoke to the nation for God. Led people in worship of God and spoke to the people for God. And so in the Old Testament, the priests from the tribe of Levi, the priests were, were uh, unblemished men. They were, uh, had their uh, personal life in order. They were clean and healthy. A priest would, had to be between 30 and 50 years old. And so a priest in the Old Testament, if you got over 50, you had to find another duty in the priesthood, but you couldn't be a priest anymore. Why? Because you, it's hard to wrestle down a bull. <laughs> you know, one of the bulls they bring for sacrifice, you got to wrestle that thing to the ground. And how do you do that? You can't do it too, too well if you're 55 or 60, right? You'll be riding that bull. Don't be offended about that. Okay, don't be offended. But they had to have proper strength and they had to have proper look and they had to be clean and washed. Matter of fact, there's a, a picture of a reenactment of priests I want to show you guys real quickly. It, it, it would wear white uh, robes, and they would be clean, and they would be prepared for sacrifice. That's what priests did in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, priests taught the Word of God to people. Priests were judges between those disputes among people. They offered sacrifices of goats and sheep and, and bulls and turtle doves. They offered sacrifices. Priests would bless the people. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face to you and give you peace. They would take care of the altar area. They would prepare the bread and make sure the fellowship bread was, in, was prepared. Fellowship bread, 12 loaves of bread that represented God's fellowship with the tribe. The lampstand would be lit, which represented the Holy Spirit. The incense prayer, incense would be lit representing prayer. And at feasts they would blow the trumpets. The priest also had one, the leader called the high priest, and what he would do is he would be the leader of the, of the priesthood. He would inquire of the Lord. He directed the work of, of the temple, and he was, a, he was a man who would go into the Holy of Holies once a year to offer up sacrifices, and they would tie a rope to him because if his heart wasn't right with God, God would strike, he could be struck dead, and they'd had to drag him out. And so God has called his nation. In, in the Old Testament, Israel was called Deuteronomy 7, 6, and 8. I won't read it all. They, it was called his chosen possession. And Israel was called by God in Exodus 19, 3 through 6. Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests. And now Peter is saying, just as Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests, so are you. Now what does that mean, a kingdom of priests? That, that, that we're royal priesthood. What, what does that mean to me today in 2018 in Beaufort, South Carolina? Well, let me put it this way. God has called you to be a, a holy priest, spiritual priest, in your home. Matter of fact, the old timers used to say this, that you're the high priest of your home, right? You ever heard that before? High priest of your home. And, and matter of fact, I'll go even further, that we used to teach how you should be the priesthood of all believers. All believers have access to the Father through Jesus Christ. You don't have to go to a priest to get access. You know that, right? You are a priest. 
I, I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. Some of you have a Catholic background, and I understand. God bless it. I'm thankful for it. But I can tell you, you don't have to go to a priest to get to the Father. You, have, you are a priest. You get to the Father through the blood of Jesus and what he did at the cross, right? He, he did. <laughs> Amen. And so what does it mean to be a kingdom of priests? Well, let me just say it this way. When Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, they sinned against God. They disobeyed God's command not to take the fruit. Here's what happened. They were called to be kings and queens of the earth, right? The Bible says, take dominion over the earth, subdue it, um, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. They were called to do that, and they knew how to worship and fellowship with God. But when they disobeyed God, God, God punished them. God threw them out. Listen, and they lost the beauty of what God had given them. Not just the garden, but the dignity of and the beauty. If there's one thing about sin that discourages me is this. Sin will degrade you. Sin, well, listen, sin will take your dignity away from you. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself in sin and you look at yourself in the mirror and going, how did I get to this place? How did I get here? Why am I even here? And what happened was sin brought you far. And the old saying is further than you want to go and costs more than you want to pay. It stays longer than you want it to stay. Sin is like that that friend that you say, you can sleep on my couch for three days until you get yourself on your feet, and a month and a half later, you're trying to call the police to get them out of your house. <laughs> right? That's what sin is. Sin, sin will stay and, and not want to leave. And so Adam and Eve were, were, were down at this place of sin, and God's redeemed. God said, I'll send my son to redeem not only Adam and Eve, but I'll redeem the whole world who would relieve, believe in me and their sins would be forgiven. And so your sins are forgiven, but now you're a kingdom of priests, which means you're not just priests, you're royal priesthood, which means, thank God your sins are forgiven. But more than that, God has restored the dignity of Jesus Christ into your heart and life so that now you know how to worship God, you can commune with God and be in a kingdom of priests, which simply means this, you declare to the world, there is a God who loves you and a God who set me free and a God who's wonderful and you need to know him that's how you're a priest well a priest in the bible offer sacrifices and you don't have to offer sacrifices anymore that are physical but you offer spiritual sacrifice back in the day they used to offer, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be a bit abrupt here but back in the uh, in the old testament they would offer sacrifices they would have to go in and they would bring a sacrifice of a lamb the blood would be there or, or a, a bull and not only would they take the blood from them, but also they would have to wash out and clean the insides. And then they'd have to burn. There was a process of burning the hide, and there's a process of cleaning everything. It was not a beautiful process. It was an ugly process. Sacrifice was an ugly thing. Blood was spilled. Entrails were out. You saw animals die. And it was harsh. It was difficult. It was hard to see. But the Bible says that because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to offer up any sacrifice. Thank God you didn't come up here with, with a bull or a goat today, right? Amen. Thank God. But what do you do? You come and you say, uh, by sacrifice was paid by Jesus. Jesus paid the sacrifice for you. He paid the price. Thank God for that. And beyond that, we're called to give spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. And so we're called not to give any more physical, but spiritual sacrifices. And can I tell you, in some ways, those are harder sacrifices to give. Because one of the scriptures says in Romans chapter 12, offer your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. So you offer your body to God as a sacrifice. What I don't know about you, I've offered myself to God many a times, but because I'm living, I like to crawl off the altar and do my own thing at times. My body is to be a sacrifice to the Lord, a living sacrifice. That I say, God, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. I'm, I'm yours. I, I belong to you. And we commit our lives to him. That's why we don't believe in the church world that you should just be a Sunday morning only Christian. I'll go to church on Sunday, and then I'll do the rest of the week what I want to do. It's like paying somebody a tip. I said, God, I'll give you a little bit of attention, and then I'll go and do whatever I want to do the rest of the week. Try that in any other relationship in your life. See how that works. Oh, son, I love you. I want to talk. I got an 11-year-old right now in kids' church. My wife and, new, wife and Chelsea, they're in Alabama. They left me with Preston. Hallelujah. <laughs> Fortnite. That's all I've been hearing, Fortnite. My Lord of mercy. 
Ay. But can you imagine me sitting down with Preston? Preston, I love you. I think you're great. Let's go out and eat. We'll eat for 30 minutes. And I talk to him. What are you interested in? What are you all about? What are you all about? And then it, hours up, boom, talk to you next week, Preston. How, how, how's that going to work? Oh, baby, I love you, honey. Tell your wife or husband, I love you, daughter, bo- boyfriend, girlfriend. I love you, the greatest thing in the world. I think you're amazing. I just don't know what I'd do without you. I'm so glad I could spend time with you. Okay, bye. I'll talk to you next week. <laughs> it's quiet in this Holy Ghost church, I can tell you that. <laughs> so a living sacrifice it isn't, isn't showing up when you just want to, to show up. It is beyond that. It is saying, God, my life is yours 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm yours. My body's yours. My mouth is yours. My thoughts are yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. Right? That's a living sacrifice. You're a priest. You're so, oh, your body should be a living. Here, here's another one. Your body should be a living sacrifice. Your worship should be a living sacrifice. The Bible says this. Let us offer up to God the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of our lips. Right? So sometimes we praise God even though we don't feel like praising Him. We praise Him anyway, Right? We have to worship him because it's called a sacrifice of praise. I heard years ago in the kids' church that somebody, some little kid was wondering, why is the church singing that? I said, what do you mean? Y'all, y'all sing, uh, the old song used to be, we bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. How many of you heard that before? We bring a sacrifice. The little kid said, why are y'all singing, I bring a sack of Frito-Lays into the house of the Lord? And one of the things, that's, just cheese ball, sorry. That's a big old cheese ball right there, corny. But there's something about pray, praising God when you don't feel like it. There's something about praising God when you're feeling great, and something about praising God when things aren't going well. There's something about saying, this is a sacrifice of praise, Lord. I, I'm going to praise you, although I did get a bad report. I'm going to praise you, although I am waiting on that phone call. I'm going to praise you, although I'm not sure what's going on. But I'm going to praise you anyway, because it's hard. It's hard. Listen, listen, listen. God is not shocked that you are struggling. But you say, Lord, I don't see it, but I'm trusting you and I praise you for who you are. And in the middle of that, you just say, God, I'm yours. And God, I trust you. You know what that's called? It's called a sacrifice of praise. The world doesn't understand that. The world's saying, why are you praising that God? What did he do for you? Where was he when this happened? Where was he when that happened? Where was he when this happened? And the world will talk to you and talk to you because they're full of the devil. Because the devil's influence in the world. But don't listen to the world. Just come to God and say, God, I praise you anyhow. I don't understand it. I don't know how to do it. But I praise you anyhow. Sacrifice of praise. And then the Bible talks about how we sacrifice in our, word, our work. The Bible says don't, don't forget doing, well, doing good because such sacrifices God is well pleased. Doing good deeds, reaching out to people. In just a, a few months from now, we'll be as a church uh, doing a night to shine. And as we prepared for that, as we were talking about night to shine this past couple weeks ago, we were getting our thoughts together. I was in uh, Publix the other day and Claudia came up to me and gave me a big hug and she said, I'm so ready. I got my dress ready. And I'm like, yes, it's time. Let's go. Doing good. Doing good works is a sacrifice. Sometimes you don't want to do stuff, but you do it anyway, not because you feel pressure, but because you do it as unto the Lord. And real quickly, another sacrifice is, is giving, sacrificial giving. You ever heard that before? Sacrificial giving, that you give to God something that costs you something. I like what David said in the Old Testament. I, uh, he, he was trying to build an altar to God and the head of the Jebusite area said, I will give you this land. He said, no, I'm not going to give God something that costs me nothing. Sacrifice. Back when I was in Bible college, we had a professor named Brother Elliot. That's what he called people. When I was in Bible college, he called everybody brother and sister. A little, you know, a little different. But anyway, Elliot. Bob Elliot. He was a preacher. He was evangelism, and he would do our teaching on the history of the assemblies of God. And at, my, at school I went to at Bible college, you, you couldn't go to movies. Movies was forbidden. You, you were forbidden to go to movies. It was wrong. It was a sin. It was wrong. Don't do go to movies. And I remember signing a, a thing that said I wouldn't go to theater. Well, I didn't know what that meant. I just signed it. It laughed. What a theater. Okay, I don't want to see Shakespeare. I'm fine with that. <laughs> the first night, uh, first week I was there, somebody said, I saw that you went to a movie. I said, I did. I said, you can get in trouble. I said, what do you mean? It said, don't go to theater. I, what? Oh, you, it means movies. Yeah, and they, they got nervous for me because I went to see, you ready? I went to saw Karate Kid too. That's all I got out of that. 
That's all I got out of that. That's all I got. That and the first one when he's hurt and he just whips that guy. I like that part. Anyway. And so I'm like, okay. Well, Dr. Elliot had a different take on it. What he would say is this. He said, you know, I don't want to go. He said, I don't go to movies. And, you know, he's old, and he's old as Moses. I'm like, okay, well, of course you don't go to movies. Sure you don't go to movies. You just rock it in your rocking chair in the evenings. You know, we're just, you know, I'm just saying. So, I mean, it's kind of what I'm thinking as a kid. I'm thinking as a young person. I'm thinking, I'm 19 when I'm hearing this. So I'm just going, okay, whatever. He said, because I don't want to go to church one Sunday and a missionary comes and the Spirit of God wants me to give an offering, and I spent my movie money already. I spent my offering money on a movie. And instead of giving ten, $10 to the missionary, I gave $10 to the movie theater. And I'm like, Brother Elliot, why'd you have to say that? You, <laughs> you just ruined everything for us. It's called a sacrifice. A sacrifice when it comes to giving is sacrificing something that costs you something. But you'd rather do that and say, God, I'm, tr- I'm, I'm going to give up this to do that. I was going to say in the first service, and I won't, I'll say it in this service, but uh, there's a family in our church when we did our building program, they were saving money to build a house, and they gave the church $10,000 out of that. They did. And the idea for them was this. They want to sacrifice. They'd rather build God's house first before their house. That's a sacrifice. That's a sacrifice. Real quickly, come on, Kirk, if you would. Not only do we have, are we priests, not only, so here, th- think about it for a minute. We don't come to a temple, we are the temple of God. We don't come to a, pre- to a priest for anything, we are priests. Last two points is we are a people. We are a people. Notice what he says, you are a chosen generation, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession. God took those slaves and turned them into, into a nation. He says, now, you're going from being individual families in sla- of slavery. Now you're going to be free, kingdoms of pr- and priests, and a nation, the people of God. And see, God has called the church. Listen, God has called us to be the temple of God together as people, host the presence of God. God has called us to be the people of God that, that we, as we work together, we're, we're priests unto God, that we show the world. We declare worship to God, and we declare the world who He is. And we offer spiritual sacrifices. But not only that, we're called a nation, a holy nation, a set-apart people. See, I, I'm, I'm grieved for our country at times. And I do believe the church has the answer for, for this world. I know that for a fact. Jesus is the answer. But I am, I am and, and I, I don't want to use the word sick and tired because they tell you, in the, you know, a spirit-filled pastor should never be sick or tired, right? But I'm, I'm about tired of all the division in our, in our country. I'm tired of it. Let me tell you why I'm tired of it. Because people are using their preferences, their race, their background as a dividing mark against other people. That's what they're doing. And I, I, am, I am so sick of seeing a, 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 another radical demonstration. I'm so sick of seeing another uh, attitude. I'm so sick of seeing these things because the truth of the matter is, as a believer, it is not about what your skin color is or your culture. What matters is that you are one in Jesus Christ. You're a holy nation. That's what he says. That's what he says. You're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're God, your possession for God's people. You are God's special possession. And I see people use their race as a, as a weapon. I see people use it as, as a divider. I really do. And if I'm getting, making y'all nervous, that's okay. It's, you're about to get real nervous. I, I'm, I'm tired of people using those things to bring people and divide people. That's why as a church, I do not, listen, hear me. I do not as a church, as a pastor, talk about the latest. I'll mention one or two things that are happening that have to deal with the church world, but I will not and do not ever get up here and talk about what I read on this social media post from this news organization or what I read some guy said on whatever because we, we get people out there who are, are uh, venting on everything. What I want to tell you is this, that in the, like just like Pastor Santos said a few weeks ago, we may be two different languages and two different cultures, but we're one body in Jesus. And in, listen, in Jesus Christ, that's the answer. Jesus Christ, 
That's the answer. And so we're a holy nation. That means if somebody comes against you, my brother, I don't care where you're from, I don't care what you look like, and I don't care what, you, what your background is. I'm standing with you because we're brothers and sisters, and we're going to fight together. We're going to stand together. We're going to be together. We're going to lock arms together. We're moving together because we are one nation. We're one people, the people of God. We're the people of God. We're the people of God. And so it doesn't matter. Thank God for our differences. Thank God for different cultures. Thank God for different experiences. But can I tell you, together, we are going to lock arms and say we're one people. One people. Under the blood of Jesus. Last point is this, and and I'll, I'll close. He has called us to be a peculiar people, a set-apart people, a people of God's own possession. He called us to be a royal priesthood, but more than that, we are called to have a purpose. Not only are are you a part of a place, not only are you a priest, not only are you a people, but also you have a purpose. What is the purpose? Well, he says it right here. That you should show forth, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. That's your purpose. Your purpose, my purpose, is we are a place together. We're part of a place. We're part of a nation, the people of God. We're the kingdom of God. We have different rules. And we have priesthood ability. We, we go to God our, ourselves and we proclaim to people. But ultimately, our purpose is this, that we should show forth the praises of him. The word in the King James is shoe forth. I like that. It doesn't mean just showing out in your mouth. It's showing out how you live. That we should show forth the praises of him who called you, excellence of him, who called you out of darkness in the marvelous light. That is your purpose. Listen, I want you to have a great family. Matter of fact, we'll talk about family in a few weeks. We want your family to succeed. We want your, your marriage to succeed. We want you to do well in your business and finances. We want you to be blessed. We believe God's going to bless you. We pray God overwhelms, blesses you. But at the end of the day, your number one purpose is that you should declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. So that, so that, so that when people say, how did your family get to where they are? I love my family, but the way they got to where we are is because there's a Jesus who loved me and died for me and changed me and turned my life around. And if you'd have known my background and my family uh, genealogy, you would be surprised where God has brought me from. But he is here, and that's why I've got a great family, because you brought me out of darkness, Lord, into marvelous light. How did you, how did you acquire so much blessing? Well, it wasn't easy. It didn't start yesterday, but things were tough. I had this poverty spirit and poverty mindset, but I started giving to God and trusting God and blessing other people, and God brought me blessing. And the reason I have everything I have isn't because of me, because of one who called me out of darkness in the marvelous light. That's how you turn the script. Because at the end of the day, other things will run out, but he will never run out. Never. And you have a purpose. Your purpose is to proclaim, show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Peter's writing this, and I I imagine he's thinking about Mary. Mary Magdalene, who was demon-possessed. Seven devils. And she's possessed by demons. And Jesus comes her way, and suddenly this woman who is in this confusing stupor, hearing voices, struggling no matter what, who knows what she was going through. She hears a clear voice in the middle of all the voices she's hearing, and it's Jesus saying, be free. And demons leave her. You know what happened to her? Called her out of darkness into light. Peter was there when Lazarus was dead for four days. He was in in the tomb, and they said, he's dead, and he can't come out. He's dead. Jesus said, roll away the stone. Jesus? Are you sure? Yes. Roll away the stone. Stones rolled away. Can you imagine Lazarus in darkness? He's dead. And all of a sudden he hears a voice, Lazarus, come forth. And suddenly he goes from darkness of death to the light of Jesus. Or the the man who was blind, the man who was blind, whose eyes were touched by Jesus, he didn't know who Jesus was. He just knew he could see, and everybody was questioning him. How did that happen? He said, I I, I don't know. I don't know who Jesus is. All I know is this. I once was blind, but now I see. I, I once was in darkness. Now I'm in light. That's the purpose that we have. You don't have to know all the theological uh, quirks. You don't have to know whether you're all millennial or post-millennial pre-trib. You don't need to know all that. Here's what you need to know. I'm showing forth the praises of somebody. I'm speaking out the praises of him who called me. That's my purpose. 
That's my purpose. Speak out the one who set me free, who gave me everything I have, who broke every bondage, who healed my body, who restored my fr rent friendships, who restored my marriages, who broke every chain, who gave life to me when I was hurting. That's my purpose. Proclaim him who called you out into something, to his marvelous light. Right now, we're going to celebrate communion. And our ushers, guys, if you would get ready. I want everyone to stand in this room. Everybody stand. And we're going to celebrate communion together as a community, as a church. We are one, one people under the blood of Jesus Christ. We're believers. We're part of the kingdom of God. We're part of a place called the spiritual house. We're priests unto the Lord offering up spiritual sacrifices and we have a purpose to proclaim him who called you out of one thing and called you into something else out of darkness into light I'm going to ask our prayer team to get ready if you would, go ahead guys if you would prayer team you may be in this service this morning this afternoon and you may say I'm in a point in my life where I need someone to pray for me Maybe you're sick in your body and you need God to heal you. Maybe you are in bondage you need it broken over your life. Maybe you're confused. Maybe you're not sure what to, where to turn next. Maybe you just need a financial provision. Whatever it is, I'm asking you to step out from where you are. And find someone to pray with you. Because there are people up here who have prayed for you and believe that God is able. If you could do it on your own, if you could try on your own effort, you would do it. But you can't do it on your own effort. You need the Lord's help in this. And the God I serve is able, more than able, to set captives free. More than able to help those that are hurting. The Bible says he's near the brokenhearted. If your heart's breaking today, he's near you. He can help you. Struggling today, he can set you free. He's here to help you today. You can take the communion cup and... Peel off the top layer. It's a wafer there. It's a piece of bread. <clears throat> we believe this represents the body of Jesus. Broken for us. <clears throat> Part of being a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We show forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness into light. Is that we have a Savior who sacrificed everything for us. And that's why we celebrate taking bread and juice to remember what he did for us. And we can be strong in him and in the power of his might. The Bible says that Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and he broke it. And after he gave it to his disciples, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I'm going to ask you to take a moment while I pray, reflect on the Lord, and we're going to take the bread together. Father, we thank you for this bread that represents your son. That, Lord, we have hope in life. We pray your blessings as we take this communion together. The idea for us, Lord, is we remember the body of Jesus, that we are a community, we are a temple, we are priests, we are a people, but we belong to you. We're your possession because you purchased us through Jesus Christ. And we take this bread in honor and remembering of you. In Jesus' name, let's take this bread together. The Bible says he took the cup, and after he had blessed it, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As I said earlier, this is communion, which means it's beyond just individually taking this. It is as a body we're taking this together, community. The temple, the people, the priests, all these things God's called us to be. As a community, we're built up together as we bless each other. And so we take this blood, remembering his blood shed for us. Would you bow your hearts with me for a moment? Father, 
thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes us clean. All the stains of sin, all the stains of the past, all the stains of generations gone by, broken, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the blood that sets us free. Thank you for the blood that speaks mercy and grace to, towards us. Thank you for the blood that you shed for us that we can be forgiven. Father, we thank you that Jesus sent his, his own, he gave his own blood for us. We celebrate that right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the cup together. Thank you, Jesus. Beautiful God, wonderful Savior, wonderful God, wonderful God. As Pastor Conrad's going to join you in the foyer, some of you who are looking to be coaches and whatnot. I want to pray this blessing over you that the priests used to pray over God's people. I want to pray this over you today. And I'm going to pray it by faith as we leave here today that we realize that we are part of the temple. We're part of the people of God. That we are priests unto God. That we're one nation. And we stand for and with each other. And that we have a purpose. And I pray blessings. Will you bow your hearts with me as I pray this blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. In Jesus' name.